Hi, I'm Frank Carlisle, and welcome to Liverpool Unnoticed, and this is my city. Here's a little Liverpool unnoticed, right at the base of Wellington's column. Because what we have is standard measures, even Imperial. Have a look at this. You've got one foot, which is here. Then you've got two feet. And the standard measures at 62 Fahrenheit, verified by the Standards Department Board of Trade. Absolutely amazing. But have a look at this one, which is on the ground. So what we have here is a standard measure of a under feet and also a standard measure of a under chains. And not only did the builders, but also the tailors from around the area use this for the bolts of cloth measuring them for you to have your suit. You didn't notice that, did you? Here we are outside the Mersey Tunnel, the 1934 Mersey Tunnel. And albeit that Paris has a Tarkty Triumph, we have two miniature Greek Triumphs. And there they are, Herbert J. Rouse's arches. But where do we pay the toll to come through the tunnel? Well, it's on the other side of the water, on the Wirral side. But they haven't always been there. We had them here in 1934. Have a look. How many times have people gone through the tunnel and never ever noticed the Art Deco toll booth today? Herbert J. Rouse's toll booth. We're here in William Brown Street, the world's heritage site, and the Queen and Prince Charles have been frequent visitors here. But in 1886, as depicted on the frieze of the Walker Gallery, so did Queen Victoria to open up the 1886 Great Exhibition. If you've seen pictures or prints of the Crystal Palace of the 1851 exhibition in London. This is almost a carbon copy. On the other side of the Walker Gallery, we have another frieze that goes completely unnoticed. This frieze depicts the signing of the Royal Charter on the 28th of August, 1207, which was handed over by King John to William de Ferris. And in the background, what you see is the Liverpool Castle and also the ships that sailed from Liverpool. Welcome to the Royal Box. We're here inside the concert room in St George's Hall. And the last time we were here, 
It was full of builder materials because they were about to refurbish it. And now you can see the difference. It's absolutely stupendous. The concert room has been shut since 1973, but today, finally, on the stage where Dickens actually read from his novels, acts are going to perform again. Bravo, Mr. Dickens, bravo. This is one of Liverpool's most famous waterfront buildings, known all over the world for the disaster that happened in April 1912. Architect Richard Norman Shaw's building is known locally as the Streaky Bacon Building. Officially, it's the White Star Building where the Titanic was registered. The middle balcony that you can see, that's where all the information was given to throngs of people that was here in the Strand about the sinking of the Titanic. With today's technology, television, radio, even texts, but in those days, they had to shout about the disaster and there was a deadly hush as all the information was given out. The streaky bacon building, known to the locals, is really a genuine Liverpool unnoticed. When people think of the liver birds, they just think of this one. There are two on the liver buildings, but in fact, there are four that overlook the city. And here's the third one. And it's on the Mersey Chambers, built by Olden Grayson in the 1880s, of the Addison Line. If you're wondering where the fourth one is, Come back and see me later. Also on the site is the weather vane of the tobacco ship, the Donnelly, that sank with all hands lost. And to immortalise the ship and honour the crew, the owner had the vane specially made and got permission of St Nicholas's to put it on top of the steeple. After all, it is the sailor's church. There's an old saying in Liverpool that concerns the Donnelly. If you're going to borrow money, someone will say you won't get that back until the Donnelly docks. Meaning you'll never get it back because the Donnelly will never ever birth again in Liverpool. With all the regeneration going on in Liverpool and the skyscrapers going up, Believe it or not, St. Nicholas's was the highest, tallest building on the waterfront. But not anymore, unfortunately. However, it has got a fantastic 
history. As you can hear of all the noise and the hustle and the bustle of Paradise Street, this is a new part of our heritage for future generations, a new history. Paradise Street has a history of its own, so bring on the Yankees. What we're actually looking at here in Paradise Street, the corner, is the American Eagle. Now this particular building has always been here ever since Georgian times. And it was a brothel, it was a pawn shop, but most importantly, what it first became was the American Consul. Marty came over in 1798 as the American ambassador. He never went to London, but he came here to Liverpool because here in Liverpool, American sailors were still coming in and out of the city. And don't forget, we were still engulfed with the American War of Independence. So Maury was actually looking after the sailors' well-being while being here in Liverpool and this is the building where the American consul was. So what's to become of the Eagle? It's been here for generations and generations. Sadly it may come under the builder's army. Something tells me that the scaffolders are not coming back with these tubes. Mind you, they have been up there since May 1945. In other words, since VE Day. The reason why the scaffolding was put up there in the first place was simple. Thousands upon thousands of people were celebrating the end of the war in Europe. The council decided to strengthen the base just in case people were overjoyed and started to climb the column itself. Here we are again outside the town hall. And who would have ever thought in today's climate when the use of mobile phones was everywhere that these two particular phone boxes were grade two made by the same architect who designed our wonderful Anglican Cathedral, Giles Gilbert Scott. Here's two of his designs of the telephone boxes. He made three. The other one is in his Anglican Cathedral. We're on our way to another spectacular Liverpool unnoticed. But just before we go, Look at this, look at these holes here. These were made by the German Luftwaffe during the 1941 May Blitz. A lovely sunny day here in William Brown Street. Could easily be in Rome with all the neoclassical buildings. But behind me is one of the most important ladies in the old of the country. And don't forget that the Romans give the country our name, Britannia. And the statue of Britannia is right here on the World Museum. What people don't notice when they're walking through St. John's Gardens, is that it's still consecrated ground belonging to the French prisoners of war from the Napoleonic Wars that are still buried here today.
the children playing on this wonderful sunny day and they think that it's just an ordinary nice park to play in but beneath their feet is incredible history. St John's Gardens, which is the back of St George's Hall, is also a memorial gardens dedicated to the people who had lost their lives in both European and world conflicts. And there's an example. The Liverpool Scottish, in memory of all who served in the regiment. There are memorials right through the gardens, and there's just a few. It's such a wonderful sight to see such a spectrum of life in a place that was once reserved for death. We're in the part of town known as the Holy Corner, and this is why. Paradise Street, Whitechapel, Lord Street, Church Street. Have a look at this. Have a look at this building next to the old BIV here in Paradise Street. People might think that this is part of an old church. It's not. In fact, it was a department store and it was built and designed by Welby Pugin, who was an architect, very famous architect, of churches throughout the land. Church Street, the hub of the shopping area. And at my feet is the connection with the church. This is the site of St Peter's Church, built in 1701. And when Liverpool received its city status in 1880, it became the Pro Cathedral. And unfortunately, it was demolished in 1923 when we had our own Anglican Cathedral. An old street trader once told me that you could set up your stall anywhere in Church Street except on the cross, because that was more or less a sanctuary stall. Here we are in Castle Street, and people every single day walk past this little gem. The British Maritime Insurance Building was built by George Grayson in 1882. And what's depicted on it is not only the maritime sailing ships, but also the very first steamship that sailed out of Liverpool, which was Isambard Kingdom Brunel's Great Eastern. Incidentally, how many of the 45,000 people that pack Liverpool Football Club every home game know that the mast that's on the cop end is actually the mast from the Great Eastern? The mosaic frieze on the building depicts from 1207 the sailing ships right up to the first steamship, which was Great Eastern. For well over a hundred years in the business quarter of the city, it still goes unnoticed by the passerby.
This is a tale of two cathedrals within one, and I'll explain in a minute. I mentioned the tale of two cathedrals a moment ago. Well, Sir Frederick Gibbard designed the top half of the cathedral in all its modern splendor. And this is the symbolic crown of thorns placed on Christ's head. And the blue stained glass represents the heavens. And the splashes of red is the blood of Christ as the crown of thorns is forced upon his head. Below here, in the crypt, was designed by Sir Edwin Leuchens, who never got to finish his masterpiece because of money wrangles. Incidentally, it would have been the second largest cathedral in the world. Sir Edwin Leuchens ingeniously recreated Christ's tomb to great effect. Just have a look at this. This magnificent brickwork represents the sunburst and the halo as Christ lies suffering on the cross. No matter where you look in this remarkable cathedral, you'll always find something new and exciting. Whether it's up in Sir Frederick Gibbet's part of the cathedral, or here, down below, in Sir Edwin Leuchens' crypt. These ferocious looking beasts are the guardians of St George's Hall, but they haven't always been here. See my friend Leo, for example, he's got a huge mane, He's got a tail, huge paws, but one thing he hasn't got, and his mouth's open, is a tongue. So why would anybody sculpt a four fantastic lions and not give them tongues? Here's the reason why. It was designed so that these lions were at the base of a fountain, and this is where the water was going through. The idea was that the water would come through the lion, through its mouth, and that's why it hasn't got a tongue. So why are they here? Well, obviously, the fountain was never built down in London. We brought them up here to Liverpool, so now they are the guardians of St. George's Hall. So the next time you pass on the bus, take a look into the lion's mouth. The Anglican Cathedral is the most noticeable building in Liverpool for its sheer size. Yet, there are things 
that are totally unnoticed. When people visit this magnificent cathedral, what they fail to notice is the actual grave of its architect, Giles Gilbert Scott. It's with great anticipation of going into the cathedral that they just simply walk over his grave. Earlier on, we were outside the town hall with Giles Gilbert Scott's two Grade 2 listed telephone boxes. Have a look at the third. Follow me. Here we are inside. Let's find that third telephone box. Here we are. And you know what? There are not many Grade 2 listed structures inside a Grade 1 listed building. And this is the third telephone box in the collection. Every cathedral has a symbolic mouse. And the Anglican Cathedral is no exception. And it's very difficult to find unless you know where it is. This is the Earl of Derby's tomb, and the mouse rests here, and there he is. The reason why it's shiny is because when people visit, they actually rub it for luck. Normally, this place, the gantry, is out of bounds to the general public, but we have special permission to show a real Liverpool unnoticed inside the cathedral. What people don't realise about this wonderful stained glass window is that the live buildings was used as a template by the glazier, because if the window wasn't there, you would see the liver, and there it is. Unfortunately, we have to leave the Anglican Cathedral now because I think a service is starting, but we need to go back outside to see another magnificent Liverpool unnoticed. And here we are. Just take a look at this. Don't be fooled. We're not in ancient Greece. We're actually in the city centre of Liverpool. This is the finest miniature Greek Doric temple in the world. Its architect, John Foster Jr., wants us his own Parthenon on his own Mount Olympus, and you can see why. Unbelievably, people don't even notice this. They simply walk past it. Incredible. This is the poshest chimney in the world. And that wouldn't look out of place on the streets of New York, next to the Empire State Building, for example. When I say chimney, what I mean is, it's an air vent for the Mersey Tunnel. And there's one on the other side of the water in Birkenhead. This is another masterpiece by Liverpool's own finest art deco architect in the world, Herbert J. Rouse. Even though it's just an air vent, the details that went into it, art deco details, 
is amazing. And that was typical of the 1930s. When you look at the basalt statues, one has its eyes open and the other has its eyes closed. That represent day and night because the tunnel is used 24 hours a day. Even though the bells of St. Nicholas's are calling the congregation for the service, I'd like you to stay with me just a minute longer. And what goes completely unnoticed here in George's Dock Way is the statue of Amy Johnson, the greatest female aviator of all time, and the sculptor Edmund C. Thompson. When we talk about detail, Thompson even put a goggles and a scarf on. Before we go to our next Liverpool unnoticed, have you ever seen this fine specimen of an eagle? I'll let you know where it is before we finish. What star sign are you? Capricorn, Taurus, Sagittarius, no matter what star sign you are, it's up here on the Cunard building. We've been on the streets of New York with Amy Johnson, but where can I take you now on Liverpool unnoticed? How about Rome? When you walk down Dale Street and look up, what you will notice is the roof of India buildings. It's no ordinary roof because the architect Herbert J. Rouse has a Roman theme and when you look closely at it, it becomes a Roman villa. Up close, India building looks very impressive, but to get the feel of the Romanesque villa, go to the top of William Brown Street for an absolute clear view. I promised earlier I'd show you the fourth liver bed. Well, there it is, on top of the art gallery, right next to Liverpool personified. And doesn't the crown make a wonderful nest for the seagull?
everybody was in shock by this particular building, from children, from the working classes, right up to the hierarchy of the churches and cathedrals. So what you see on the frieze is basically an advert to be insured with the Royal Insurance Company. It was designed by Francis L. Doyle, and everybody associates this particular building with the Gold Dome. Another feature on this extraordinary building is the sundial. And please, albeit that the sun is shining on it, don't ask me the time. Sadly, we can't get in here today, and it's been closed a very long time. But hopefully, with the regeneration of the city, maybe one day in the very near future, we will be able to go inside when it's utilised again. There is so much history within a hundred yards of the Royal Insurance. Take a look at this building. So why was it cut in half? Was it damaged? Was it bomb damaged? No, this beautiful building was cut in half to make way for one of our modern buildings today. Needs I say more. We're here inside Barn Street, and this is one of our new friends, the Superland Manana. Just been here a matter of years. But this is not what it's about. This is about one of our old friends who goes completely unnoticed. Next time you pass on the bus, just look up, because what you'll see is our old friend, Neptune which is on the building of John Moore's University, built in 1928 by Albert Jenkins. People love to count the liver birds. Try counting the Neptunes of this city. It'll take you all day. And this is just an example of one of them. So why is Neptune synonymous with Liverpool? He's God of the sea, and he's there to look after our ships and sailors. This beautiful Georgian building built in 1788 was one of the first mansions in Dale Street. But on the site was born William Morris, who was one of the signatories on George Washington's American War of Independence. We started our journey at the highest point in Liverpool, and this is where it ends. This is St George's Church, which has a unique history all of its own, but that is for the next time, so join me then. Do I look alright? How's the wig? <laughs>